questions to the Minister of Justice. Thank you. Question one. <clears throat> The care of people who work and live in our prisons is of paramount importance and is taken very seriously by my department. The Northern Ireland Prison Service was quick to respond to the threat imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic and introduced a range of measures to minimise the risk of transmission of the virus within prisons. Testing for staff on people in our care was introduced in April 2020 through the Belfast and Northern Trusts and the South Eastern Trust for People in Custody and was bolstered by the implementation of contact tracing procedures across the organisation in May 2020. Since the introduction of testing arrangements, 1,822 prisoners and 485 staff have been tested at McGavery, 51 prisoners and 231 staff have been tested at McGilligan, and 242 prisoners and 167 staff have been tested at Hyde Bank Wood. 132 of our prisoner escort and court custody staff have been tested, 20 staff from the Prison Service College and 30 staff from Prison Service Headquarters. In addition, we have also facilitated testing for 274 family members of Prison Service staff. As a result of these tests, seven prisoners who were in quarantine on committal and three prisoners in the general population have tested positive. One prisoner tested positive prior to committal to NIPS custody and two prisoners tested positive during long-term hospital stays. 94 members of staff have tested positive and they have all received the necessary support and advice from NIPS. As a collective, the measures that have been implemented have succeeded in extreme conditions in minimising the transmission of COVID-19 within our prisons. It is another example that shows by working together we can provide good outcomes for those in our care and those who work in their service. I thank the Minister for the detail. What I'm wondering is, within the, the confined space that is a prison, uh, how you effectively conduct uh, track and trace and indeed isolate those who have been in close contact uh, with those who have tested positive. Uh, we have within each prison establishment an isolation unit where all members who are committed to our care have to reside or anyone who leaves our care and returns subsequently to our care for a period um, of not less than 10 days. Um, and during that time, if they develop any symptoms, they can then um, go through the normal um, test process. With respect to test and track and trace, um, obviously, all of those who enter the prison system and who leave the prison system, um, in terms of those who provide care um, and support to prisoners, will have um, their movements in the prison tightly controlled. And therefore, in fact, track and trace is much simpler within the prison system than it may be within the general population. In addition, um, we ensure that when anyone does develop symptoms, they move to the isolation unit. Um, and there, all of the staff are in full PPE, um, and therefore minimising the risk um, to those who work uh, within that unit. All those who arrive at the prison from outside, whether that be to provide services within the prison or um, to visit um, during this period, also have to take additional precautions, and those have been introduced. Indeed, we have had to limit visits, um, in-person visits, on a number of occasions um, during the last number of months. And whilst that is regrettable, we've also been able to work to implement um, virtual visiting in order to try to protect prisoners and their families at what is a very difficult time for both. I call Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, we're all aware of the concern and rise um, in post positive COVID cases over the last couple of months. Minister, are you satisfied that the highest possible health and safety protocols are in place within the prisons to protect prisoners and staff? Yes, I am. And I think that we have shown that, for, certainly for those within the prison, um, that we have managed to maintain very low levels um, of, tests, of um, positive COVID tests. It has to be said that, of course, we are affected, as, um, as every other institution and every other part of society, um, by the increased rates um, of COVID uh, within the community, and particularly those who live out in the community are affected by that, so our prison service um, staff and their families. And so we do obviously um, watch very carefully um, in terms of the need for people to self-isolate, um, for people who may have symptoms to be tested, in order that we can achieve the best possible protection both for them, their families and the people in our care. It isn't a simple process, but of course we have responded um, to the recent outbreak in the more stringent measures, for example, by um, again stopping with the 
um, in person visiting um, in order to take account of higher prevalence in the community. Moving on, I call Orlea Flynn. May I get to last can call you um, question number two, please? The COVID temporary release scheme I introduced at the end of last March has allowed the temporary release of certain categories of prisoners who have three months or less of their custodial sentence remaining on an ongoing month-by-month -month basis. The improving health situation has allowed me to pause the scheme at the end of August for two months, but an increase in public infection rates led me to reintroduce the scheme from the start of November. I also agreed for the releases at the start of December, in the Christmas week and at the beginning of this month. Given the ongoing public health crisis, I intend agreeing to further releases at the start of February. Thereafter, I plan to keep the scheme under review on a month-by-month -month basis. I call Orlea Flynn. Gora Melgut, I thank the Minister for um, her answer. And obviously, she had mentioned the, the public health crisis that we're, we're currently in, and she'll be aware of the complex health needs um, among the prisoner population that we've spoken about before. So I'm just wondering, on that basis, um, can the Minister give an update if she's had any conversations with the Minister of Health on um, the vaccine rollout among the prisoner population and indeed the staff? Thank you. It is a matter which I have raised um, with the Minister of Health. As you will know, um, the rollout of the vaccine is governed by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation um, on a UK-wide basis. And at this stage, it is not planned um, to roll that out within the prisons. Um, however, I have raised my concerns in that regard um, with the Minister of Health because I believe that as a residential setting, there are particular risks to those both who work in the prisons and reside in the prisons. And I think as the member, um, the Ulster Unionist member who asked question one, um, indicated um, in that very close quarters that we have, although we have managed to reduce the number of people sharing cells, for example, um, as a result of the work we've done, I think that there is a strong case and a strong argument to protect um, prisoners, um, prison officers and their families um, by rolling out the vaccine there more rapidly than perhaps in the rest of the community. There may also be an opportunity, given the lack of stability of some of the uh, vaccines themselves, um, that large-scale immunisation um, in a facility like a prison may actually be of benefit in terms of driving the process forward. I call Doug Beatty. Thank you, Minister. Um, uh, if I could ask, and I think I'll get a positive response to this, but could the Minister outline how many of those who were released early on this scheme uh, have re-offended uh, and been returned to prison? Well, I thank the member um, for, uh, for his question. As he will be aware, it was a decision that I only took um, after, I think, what, could be what I would say was a fairly um, difficult decision, um, because I didn't think that it was something that I would be comfortable uh, with releasing. But the numbers of people who have re-offended uh, whilst um, they are on, um, on temporary release, um, I think, um, are re relatively small. As he will be aware, some of those people um, will not have been, will have been accused of a crime and committed back to our custody on remand and therefore may face further charges, um, and others will have been returned to prison um, by, the, by dint of them having um, broken their, their, their regulations around their release. However, I think at the last check, the percentage was somewhere around the 10% mark, but I will give the member the full and detailed figures um, in writing. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Justice Minister what community intervention has been provided for those released under the scheme? Um, with respect to those provided um, with those released under the scheme, um, the first thing that we have to check is to ensure um, that when we do release a prisoner that they have somewhere to go. So we take um, the opportunity um, to work closely uh, with housing and others to make sure that they have secure accommodation in place. And we make sure um, that we are in that, in that position um, to be able to then ensure that they are able to have the support um, that is required. Of course, a prisoner who is in the last three months of their sentence will, in most cases, um, have gone through some pre-testing release. Um, indeed, they may have been preparing um, for their eventual release. And so they are at an advanced stage within the prison system before they're, they're considered for release. We also consider the vulnerability of prisoners before release because obviously we're conscious that we don't want to release people into the community who may have specific needs that could not be met, for example, by the health service um, during this particularly difficult time. And so we try to ensure that those who are released from our custody are those who are most likely to be able to rehabilitate um, successfully. Um, and I just wanted um, to 
uh, update the member. I've actually just found the figure. Um, around 7.5% of prisoners who were released temporarily, so actually less um, than I indicated, and around 10%. So 7.5% of prisoners released under the scheme have been returned to prison as a result of alleged further offending due to their early release period. That, I think, compares very favourably to the figures for those prisoners serving a determinate sentence who are released on licence more generally. Um, and I think that that is a very positive experience um, in terms um, of how we have selected the prisoners and shows that the right support has been in place for them in the community. Moving on, I call Sinead Bradley. Deputy Speaker, question three, please. My department instructed senior counsel seeking advice on the possible repercussive effects of the legal aid provisions in the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill on the 11th of December 2020. Advice was provided to the department in response to this instruction on the 13th of January 2021, that is last Wednesday. Supplementary advice was received on the 15th of January 2021, last Friday. The advice received is under consideration within the department. It will inform the development of an economic appraisal of the provisions in the bill. I call Sinead Bradley. Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, thank you for the update so far. Given that we don't have the actual detail of that advice, can the Minister give an assurance at least that in the event of there not being a repercussive effect, the costings have been carried out within the Department on the effect of the bill as it stands on the Legal Aid Bill as a whole? Well, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, the legal advice to the Department is, of course, protected by legal privilege. Um, and that's an important principle that enables the provision of frank and clear advice by legal representatives to their clients. However, I do want to be open and transparent with members about the decisions that will be taken in relation to those important protections and about the basis on which they're taken. I will therefore ensure that the Justice Committee is fully briefed on these issues as they progress. But I have already given my word in this chamber and indeed in other places that where it is possible, we will be commencing the legal aid provisions at the same time as we commence the rest of the bill. I call Linda Dillon. Thank the Minister for her answer so far. Can the Minister indicate if, if she has a time frame as to when the due diligence may be completed? Well, I'm hoping to meet with officials um, in the next few days in order to discuss the legal advice that I've received further with them. However, there will be additional due diligence, as you will appreciate, that will need to be undertaken. But I will be writing to the Justice Committee to appraise them of the detail of that in due course. I call Rachel Woods. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, and I thank the Minister for answers so far. With regard to the economic appraisal that the Minister referenced, um, could the Minister detail what this entails? And has she discussed with executive colleagues the resource requirements of this bill? The resource requirements have indeed been discussed with executive colleagues both in December uh, when this was originally made uh, and indeed subsequent um, to uh, the further consideration stage of the bill. And we will, of course, um, be looking at the wider implications um, in terms both of repercussiveness in the rest of the UK and also repercussiveness uh, with other parts um, of the legal aid system. And once we have completed that due diligence, we will write to the committee uh, with further updates. Moving on, I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question four. Mr Speaker, I very much recognise the value of the work prison staff do on behalf of our community. While their work is largely unseen, we should never underestimate how demanding it is as they challenge and support some of the most complex, difficult and vulnerable members of our community who have been placed into their care. I am grateful to the member for the interest he has taken on this issue over a number of years and the support he and other members present have given to serving and retired prison staff. I very much recognise that the role of the prison officer and governor can be a stressful one, and I have been very clear since taking office that we need to do more to support them. That is why I appointed Siobhan Keating and Gillian Robinson to undertake a review of support services for operational staff, and Graham Walker to do likewise for retired staff. I was pleased to receive their reports on the 16th of December, and it is my intention to publish both documents, along with a detailed action plan outlining how we will implement the recommendations next week. Both reports are well researched and it would be difficult to disagree with the conclusions reached by the authors. There is recognition of the considerable work the prison service has been doing under its prison's 2020 programme to support staff, but it is clear 
and that we must support the prison service to do more. Mr Speaker, I'm grateful to Siobhan, Gillian and Graham for undertaking this very important work. They deserve considerable credit, not least because they have busy full-time jobs and therefore had to do much of this work in their own time. I have no doubt that the value of their work will be recognised by members when reports are published. In conclusion, I want to assure the House that I am committed to supporting the prison service as they implement recommendations and ensure prison staff, past and present, receive all of the support that they deserve. Chris Little for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I echo the Justice Minister's recognition of the work of prison officers in our community and thank the Justice Minister for the priority she has given to prison officer welfare for commissioning the reviews of serving and former prison officer welfare and support so promptly in her tenure and for the speedy reporting of the review recommendations. Can I ask the Justice Minister to outline the timescale for implementation of the recommendations of both reports? Many of the recommendations will be relatively straightforward and will be able to be implemented within a few months. Others will take more time and will require additional funding. That funding will have to be secured and it will be necessary to procure some of the additional services that have been recommended. A small number of recommendations will also require careful discussion with the Department of Finance. As I have said, I will publish a report to the Assembly next week. I will also publish an action plan which will set out indicative dates for implementation. Um, and I hope um, that as a result of that, we will be able to work together with the Justice Committee in order to ensure that it is swiftly implemented and that the benefits of what, the work that has been done will be felt by prison officers very soon. I call Paul Given. Can I welcome the Minister's announcement that she will be revealing all of this next week? Um, I met with uh, both of the review teams as part of their investigation. I registered an interest as I do now. My father served for 36 years and is now retired, as did an uncle of mine. Um, in speaking to both of them, I relayed for operational staff issues around shift patterns, social club access, exclusive to prison officers, access to counselling services akin to what we have for the police and the PRRT. Are those areas, not that the Minister may want to reveal uh, so much ahead of next week, but are those areas going to be taken forward by this review team and then greater assistance for those retired officers who continue to suffer the mental trauma of what they experienced, particularly during the maze? Well, the member obviously will um, be very much um, aware, more than most um, in the chamber, of the challenging and unique role carried out by prison officers. Um, the People's the people Strand of Prisons 2020 is dedicated to ensuring that staff receive the wellbeing, support, recognition and development opportunities that are deserving of such a role. We will continue to do so, and I hope that this report, um, when it is published, will provide the member with encouragement um, that there will be opportunity not only for those who are currently in service to receive the bespoke support that they need, recognising the challenges and indeed the threats that prison officers face, um, but also that those who have been traumatised over many years as a result of working in the prisons, um, but who no longer do work in the prison service, will also have access to that appropriate support, um, particularly around trauma um, and recovery from it. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to thank the Minister for her words today with regard to her support for prison service staff and her recognition of how difficult a job it is. And uh, for the record, I'd like to once again just uh, my, my interest is that I was a former uh, servant prison officer. Um, I want to thank Mr Little for his work uh, in bringing this review forward and also Mr Beattie from my own party. Uh, the, the collective work has been excellent and is well received by the service. Um, can the Minister give an idea of how many uh, serving prison officers are presently receiving treatment or presently off work due to diagnosed mental health issues, given that that is one of the purposes of this review? I don't have those figures to hand um, to be able to give to the member, but he is correct in saying that there are um, a significant number of issues around mental health and wellbeing, and we recognise that that is a particular challenge for those who work in a frontline service like prisons, uh, where they can be dealing with a really challenging cohort of individuals with complex needs, um, and they do so, I have to say, in a very impressive manner. Um, in terms of the recommendations in the report, they will build on the work that we already do to support officers, um, and I would be happy to write to the member uh, with more detail in terms of just the numbers who are out at the moment. Of course, we have additional people out at the moment um, because of COVID, um, additional to those who may be out as a result of trauma or stress, um, but I will write to the member um, with those figures. Moving on, I call Philip McGowigan. 
Gurm Elgut, Cash Deborah Kuig, question number five. I'm pleased to advise that all of the six collaborative projects identified as delivery priorities for the first two years of the Digital Justice Strategy 2020 to 2025 are underway and progressing well. These projects optimise efforts of criminal justice organisations to work more efficiently through the use of digital platforms and technology and ultimately make things better for citizens. The delivery of this strategy has led to tangible improvements such as electronic sharing of digital evidence between PP PSNI and PPS, as well as the provision of pending case information to assist the management of Crown Court cases. I anticipate the further rollout of digital evidence sharing within the next year across courts and with the legal profession. My department is working in partnership with Victim Support NI and NSPCC to scope out the needs, expectations and requirements of victims and witnesses to introduce a new solution to provide personalised information about the progress of their case. We will continue to review our progress against the digital justice strategy and work collaboratively to identify future priorities for the benefit of citizens who engage with the justice system. I call Philip McGuigan for supplementary. Gurmilgut, uh, last can call your August uh, Gurmilgut to the Minister Fosta, and uh, I welcome the uh, answer and the progress uh, so far on the rollout of the digital justice strategy. As the Minister said, it's a five-year strategy, but there were commitments within the first two years uh, about bringing about changes that would undoubtedly make a huge difference in speeding up the criminal justice system. So, can I ask the Minister uh, just to confirm if? The progression of the constituent parts that she's outlined and the strategy as a whole uh, will meet its target? Well, it is certainly our intention that it would. Of course, we have also been battling um, with COVID, and that has provided significant challenges right across the court system and indeed right across our justice partners in the justice system. However, whilst the COVID-19 challenges are well known, the opportunities that it has presented to accelerate certain areas of digital justice are often overlooked. And we have been working very hard to ensure um, that digital operation during the COVID crisis can be embedded within the system and hopefully um, going forward that we will be able to maintain much of the digital and remote working that we've been able to embed during this crisis, and it will provide, obviously, then further opportunities for flexibility in the future. I call Alan Chambers. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, Minister, given the recent accidental but serious release of information on the identity of former police officers in respect to the Neil McConville case, can the Minister confirm the security of information on the upgraded Causeway IT system? Thank you. Well, as the member will know, the Causeway system is used by the PSNI and other justice partners in terms of sharing information. Um, but the issue um, that was at fault in that particular case did not reside within the, just, within the sharing um, systems, but actually I think was a result um, of human error on that occasion. Um, and that has been addressed. And I think I have previously um, explained to members of this chamber um, the measures that were taken to ensure that the accidental but very distressing passing on of that information um, by LIU um, was contained very quickly, um, that the information was recalled and destroyed, um, and that further measures have been put in place to ensure um, due diligence to make sure that such re uh, incidents are not repeated in future. Moving on, I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number six. The Joint Agency Task Force is an operational task force led by senior officers from the Police Service of Northern Ireland and Garda Shikana, uh, the Review Commissioners and HM Revenue and Customs. A number of other organisations, including the National Crime Agency and the Criminal Assets Bureau, are also involved in operational activity. The PSNI has confirmed that the negotiated agreement means that there are no identified issues for the cross-border joint agency task force brought about by EU exit. The ability to conduct coordinated joint operations and share information between the agencies within the JATF remains. The negotiated agreement reduces any obvi obvious new emerging criminal threats within organised crime, although these issues will continue to be monitored by partner agencies who will be alert, for example, to any attempt to circumvent the arrangements required for the supply of highly regulated goods from GB to Northern Ireland. Any of the justice and home affairs powers affected by EU exit do not inhibit the, uh, the ability of the JATF to function effectively. I call Matthew Toll for supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful for, for that answer. Intrigued by what the Minister said. The, so the, 
law enforcement said there are no identified um, issues. Are there, no, are there are no issues at all around slowing down, for example, um, arrest warrants, obviously, with the European arrest, arrest warrant now, and also no access to SIS2. Is it the fact that there's no broad identified um, issues in terms of crime enforcement, or is it just that things will be slower? And secondly, can I ask, is there a specific budget resource implication for her department as a result of EU exit, and has she made a bid to the Finance Minister for extra money uh, to deal with the consequences of Brexit? Thank you. Well, Mr Speaker, I think those are two slightly separate issues. With respect to the issue um, of European arrest warrants, um, of course there will be some delay because those will now operate um, under a different convention, the Lugano Convention, and we have already identified that that will be um, a slower process um, than the European arrest warrant, and so that is, that is recognised. However, I was answering with respect to the operational capacity of the JATF, and so that is a slightly different um, question. From our perspective, um, while of course there are issues and challenges around um, the, the exit from the EU in terms of, first of all, the opportunity um, for um, enhanced crime um, on a cross-border basis um, due to smuggling and other things, that has been mitigated somewhat by the fact that at this stage there's no differentials in terms of tariffs. So the main area we believe would be exploited is within those very highly regulated goods. The other issue that the member, of course, will be aware of is um, in terms of the ability to share data, and we currently have um, a derogation around data adequacy. However, were the data adequacy agreement to come to an end, that would, of course, be a major challenge, not only for the JATF, but indeed for the PSNI and Angarda Shikana more generally. I call Kiva Archibald. Last can call you, and I thank the Minister um, from, for her response so far. Um, in relation to, I suppose, the destructive impact of Brexit that we've already seen in, in the, uh, the new year, in the first few weeks of it, have there been any immediate challenges to the wider policing and justice system as a result of Brexit in 2021? With respect to the withdrawal agreement that has finally been agreed in the future partnership, um, part of that was the future security partnership. Um, that has actually been a much better um, part of the negotiation than perhaps the future trade arrangements have been. And so where there are clearly issues around um, the, the trading arrangements, um, there have been fewer issues um, around the future security partnership. Indeed, if you look at the, at the tools, the European tools with which we've been able um, to maintain um, our integrity and our operational capacity, uh, we have got much more access than we originally anticipated um, as a result of those negotiations. And I think it highlights how important it is that despite the frustrations people may feel um, around the trade elements of this deal, that without this deal, we would be in a much more um, and a much more serious um, situation uh, when it comes to the issue of security. I think it's important, also, just um, reflecting on the members, uh, the previous members' question, that there will, of course, be challenges. But at this point, we have not put forward bids around Brexit. We are, however, aware. Um, that the PSNI have made bids for additional resource because they still believe that they need additional officers in order to police Brexit. And we are now awaiting Treasury um, coming back because the indications so far have been that they do not intend to extend Brexit funding into next year. That would be a very serious matter. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number seven. Civil and family justice cooperation does not feature in the trade and cooperation agreement, and these areas now are now largely governed by existing international agreements. In the family justice field, this leaves relatively few gaps, as Hague Conventions, such as the 1996 Hague Convention relating to cross-border contact, contact, residence and child protection cases, and the 2007 Hague Convention, which applies to cross-border maintenance cases, cover much of the same ground as the EU instruments. In relation to civil and commercial law, there are limited international cooperation mechanisms. The only substantial one is the Lugano Convention 2007, which the UK has applied to rejoin, and a decision on this is awaited. In the meantime, other than in cases where there is an exclusive choice of court co uh, contract covered by the 2005 Hague Choice of Court Convention, that is a commercial contract where both sides agree at the outset the jurisdiction in which a dispute will be heard. Cross-border disputes will be left to the domestic rules of the relevant countries to resolve. This will unfortunately lead to a lack of clarity over which court has jurisdiction in a case and potentially more expensive and lengthier parallel proceedings. 
The Trade and Cooperation Agreement includes provisions on law enforcement and judicial cooperation in criminal matters. I'm afraid our time is up and you'll not be able to get a supplementary on this occasion. Uh, that is the end of our questions to list it. Uh, quick questions to the Minister. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call William Irwin. Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I ask the Minister in relation to the creation of a Nightingale facility for tribunals of the International Convention Centre in Belfast? Minister, what is your opinion on the accessibility of such a venue for those awaiting a benefit appeal, especially for those that have a disability or those that are unwell? Uh, Mr Speaker, the creation of the Nightingale facility um, at the at the International Conferencing Centre um, at the Waterfront Hall facility um, is a major step forward in terms of providing additional space and capacity both for tribunals um, and indeed for the, right, the routine business of courts. I understand, um, though I have yet to confirm, that there was um, an inquest scheduled um, to be held there um, today. And so it shows that with that extra space we are able to make real progress in terms of courts. It is an accessible facility and one that is, is modern and designed for that purpose. However, of course, it is located in Belfast, and members may well say that it may be accessible to me um, in Belfast, but it may not be so accessible to those who live more rurally. But of course, we are looking for other um, opportunities to find breakout space um, that will supplement the work that we do at the court hubs that we have reopened um, during this particular crisis. And we have put in additional space um, in the, in the means, by means of mobile buildings um, and inside the actual court, uh, the, the court curtain itself in order to ensure that at all of our premises um, we are able um, to manage um, properly the social distancing um, and all of the other requirements to combat COVID and make our courts a safe place for people to attend. I call William Irwin for supplementary. Thank you. And, uh, can I thank the Minister for her response? The Minister will accept, I'm sure, that for those living in the west of the provinces could necessitate a 100-mile journey each way. Uh, so it will be imperative that Another venue could be found for people in the West as well. Yes, and of course we are looking at additional um, at other opportunities where we are able um, to roll out additional facilities. And the member will be aware, um, as I said in my original question um, or the original answer, that we are going to try to do that at each of the court hubs to create more space and um, to help with business. Some cases will, however, still remain only able to be heard um, in terms of the lag inside court, simply due to the scale um, and capacity issues that we may have at some of our other courthouses. Um, and indeed, the same may be true of some tribunals. It is a disruption, and we accept that. But we are also increasing the amount of remote working and remote attendances. So for many people um, who are engaged in proceedings, they may not have to be present in the court um, in order to do business. And we would encourage people, before they come to the court um, and before they may they present themselves at court and um, that they work um, with their own um, represent representatives and with court officials to ensure that their presence is absolutely required because otherwise it would be best for them not to attend. Could, could I encourage members that when asking a question they would face the chair. The microphones are generally located so that they will pick you up if you face the chair and uh, we want to ensure that Hansard has a, an accurate record of, of proceedings. I call it Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I shall face you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the uh, thank you and for call on the minister? Or sorry, can I ask the minister for an update on the progress of the outline business case for additional police officers, as agreed within the new decade new approach? The outline business case um, has been um, proceeding with the Department of Finance and we have had permission now to move to a strategic business case to be provided um, by the PSNI and we work with them um, in that regard. However, it would be fair to say um, to the member um, in asking the question that obviously his desire, as is mine, um, is to find the additional funding that would allow that um, to be not just uh, a successful business case but actually operationalised. And I have to say that in the current um, financial environment, um, and given the fact that we have not even had confirmation um, from Treasury that the COVID money, which allowed the police to employ over 300 new officers um, in the run-up to Brexit, um, with that not being confirmed going forward, um, it does create a significant challenge um, for the police if they wish um, to further extend their numbers. I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, it was back in the 
August uh, 2019 when the Chief Constable first raised the question of his need for an additional 800 officers. Um, given what the Minister has just said and 14 months into her tenure uh, 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 as Minister, what confidence can she give to the Chief Constable that the 800 officers will be delivered, bearing in mind the critical, situ critical health situation at the moment and indeed the number of officers that are not available to the, the Chief Constable at this stage? Well, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I know last year felt like a long time, but I can assure the member that it isn't 14 months since I took up my position last January. There are only 12 months in a year, and it's 12 months um, almost to the day since I took up my position. With respect to support um, for the PSNI, um, there is additional support. Um, indeed, the, the PSNI made and then withdrew a bid um, in terms of additional funding to cover um, COVID overtime because they, be, they believe that they can meet that um, from within their current budgets. So we do liaise with them regularly to ensure that they have capacity. Of course, the recruitment of new officers is not an overnight issue and wouldn't actually do anything um, to mitigate against the challenges that we face uh, with COVID. However, I remain committed um, it, to try to secure the funding, and we know that the full year costs are around 40 million um, once all officers are recruited and embedded within service delivery. However, the, minister, the member will be aware that we are facing a budget which is likely to be flat cash for all departments. That gives us very little scope um, in order to be able to provide additional funding, and it will, of course, ultimately reside with the Chief Constable to prioritise the resources available to him and decide whether that is for additional officers or whether it is for some of the other projects which she has said are a priority for the PSN at this time. I call Karen Lee Killen. Thank you, uh, Last Khan Colin. Thank you very much um, for your um, answers now. So now that we've established it's been a year from you are all um, in the executive, um, you will be aware of the new decade, new approach, which included the British government commitment to introduce legislation within 100 days particularly to implement the legacy mechanisms contained within the Stormont House Agreement. Can the Minister tell us what conversations or what developments between herself and her department officials have had with the NIO and indeed the British Government on the delay in this legislation? Well, the member will be aware that um, whilst I, as a party leader um, and as a political leader, have had many conversations uh, with the Secretary of State, I could probably best um, describe them as frustrating uh, when it comes to the issue of legacy. We have, as a department, continued to try to engage on this issue um, to make them aware um, of the urgency of dealing with this and the importance of dealing with it in a comprehensive um, way. It does bring pressures on the Department of Justice's budget because in the absence of a comprehensive strategy to deal with legacy, uh, we find more and more victims will take recourse to the courts through legacy litigation, uh, will seek inquests or other me means of trying to resolve for them the need for truth and justice, which they cannot currently receive through the Stormont House arrangements that were, um, were anticipated to be brought forward. I would have to say that at our review um, of the NDNA commitments last week, it was heartening to see how many of those have been progressed. Um, I characterised it, though, as often low-hanging fruit, where we were dealing with the easy things and not dealing with the difficult questions that have often blighted this assembly. I would have to say perhaps it stands amongst the only issues, however, where we have actually gone backwards from the NDNA agreement was signed, and it is a shame, given the sensitivity of legacy issues, that that is the place in which we find ourselves. I call Karen McKillen for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for a very, very honest and, and robust uh, response, and given the fact that she probably has scars like many parties of Storm House Agreement six years ago. She has indeed outlined some of the negative impacts on all families, regardless who they are or how they identify themselves. And she's also indicated some of the impacts on her potential budget. But could she outline other impacts that you know, not having any significant progress or progress at all and the refusal of the British government to legislate for the Stormed House Agreement will not only have for her department but indeed the entire executive? Well, I think it's well known that if these, um, if these issues have to be dealt with by the Department of Justice and if there isn't 
um, the structures in place that were promised um, under Stormont House. There is a major question arising as to what happens to the funding that was set aside for Legacy Matters um, and was anticipated to be used to set up the HIU and the other structures around Stormont House. We have been informed um, by the NIO that that is not money we can draw down for other purposes and therefore that money sits and waits um, for an alternative structure to be brought forward. However, fundamentally, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is not about money. This is about people's confidence, first of all, in the government to uphold agreements that it makes. We have all come back to this place and are working together through difficult times, often when we are not all of one mind on issues, and I think that would be putting it mildly. Um, but we have come back and we have done what was required of us. And I think it's time the UK government also did what was required and promised by it when it said that it would take this forward in the first 100 days. I think more than our trust and confidence, however, um, as parties when we do these negotiations. There is an issue here about trust and confidence in the system from those victims who still wait truth, from those people who are accused of wrongdoing and who want to be able to prove their innocence and who have this sort of Damocles hanging over their head constantly. I think that the only moral thing to do is to take this forward and to take it forward as a matter of urgency. And I will, along with executive colleagues, engage with the Secretary of State and um, with the Tonishta to ensure that we can do so as a matter of urgency. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, in light of the Gordon Adair's Radio Ulster investigation, did the right man hang? A new evidence presented on the 90-year-old case on the supposed murder of Minnie Reid and the supposed hanging of Harold Courtney. Will the minister give permission for all records held by Prony on the court and prison and police service to be released for public research? Um, Mr Speaker, the issue of release of records from Prony is not a matter for the Minister of Justice. Prony lies within the Department um, of Culture, um, the Department of Communities. Um, almost went backwards there in time um, to the Department of Communities. Um, and I think it would be for that Minister um, to have engagement. But I will say um, that where we can be of assistance to the families, we will be happy to do so. Calling Alex Easton for some minute. Thank the Minister for her answer so far. Would the Minister agree with me that in such an old case that any records that could be released uh, to find out what the truth is would be welcome? I think irrespective of the length of time, um, I think justice is always welcome and I think that that point has been made both in the previous question and in this question. I don't think the passage of time should deny people access to justice. I think it is important that that option is still available where practicable and I would hope that we would be able to be of assistance where that is possible um, and certainly um, allow people um, to be able to find out the truth behind those situations. I call Orlia Flynn. Carmel, good to ask can call you. Um, Minister, following the initiative that was introduced in Britain um, last week where domestic abuse victims can go to a pharmacy and use the Ask for Annie code word to indicate um, that, that they need help, can the Minister update us if there's any work ongoing to introduce um, a similar scheme here locally? Thank you. I'm delighted to be able to confirm um, to the member that we are part of that Ask for Annie scheme so that if someone goes to their local Boots pharmacy um, here in Northern Ireland and they see the literature which will be on display um, as part of the Home Office scheme, they will be able also to ask for Annie. They will be escorted to a safe place within the building and given the opportunity by a trained um, councillor who will be there to be able to phone um, and ask for help and assistance as required. It is a hugely powerful scheme and there will be opportunity also for other pharmacies to sign up to that scheme and provide it in communities where there may not be a Boots pharmacy available. Hugely important um, given that often, particularly during the current COVID crisis, going to the pharmacy may be one of the few places, the, one of the few private opportunities that someone gets to raise concerns about domestic abuse and so it's a very powerful way forward. Members clear there's mobile phone causing interference so I'd ask you to check your own phone. I call Arlia Flynn. Thank you. I'll ask Khan Kolya and I thank the Minister for her answer. And you actually touched on some of um, this next question in your previous answer there. I'm just wondering so how the scheme is being rolled out um, here in the north. It makes sense that it's rolled out um, similar to how it's, um, it's being delivered across these islands. Um, so maybe that work's already taken place, but it was just to ensure that you do have that consistency of approach. And is this something that you're discussing with um, other Justice Ministers at the minute? Thank you. Yes, it is, and I mean each of the each of the um, pharmacies which are signed up for the scheme 
uh, will display the literature and posters in the pharmacy so that people will be able to see it. Many pharmacies have now moved to develop consulting rooms uh, within the pharmacy in order that there is a private place where people can speak to a pharmacist if they have a, a minor medical complaint and are seeking assistance. And they will make use of those consulting rooms to give an individual privacy in order to be able to con contact either the 24 hour um, domestic abuse and sexual abuse helpline um, or to make contact with the PSNI if that is required. I would encourage anyone, however, even if the scheme is not visible, even if the signs are not there, if you get the opportunity um, when you're with your pharmacist, even just to ask for help for a private word, um, I know that many pharmacists would be more than happy um, to give you whatever assistance you need. And I would encourage the member um, and all members to encourage their constituents to be confident about asking for help. And our time for questions, the Minister of Justice is now up. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments uh, before the next minister takes his place.